We have lots of reasons to be negative. Life isn't fair. There's nothing certain but death and taxes. If, if something can go wrong, it will. I had the experience last weekend. It was set up for, for one of these weekends where I just was going to have it made. Murray took the kids to Atlanta, and I was just, you know, college football, and I was just going to sit around and do nothing. Perfect, perfect weekend for, for a guy. And, uh, and then I walked in after work on Friday, came home. They had already left, and uh, it felt kind of warm in the house. And what I realized is my air conditioning went down on the Friday of Labor Day weekend, which is, yeah, yeah, that is not not a good time. And I was able to get a guy out on Saturday, but he said, you know, uh, it needs a it needs this thing which isn't available until Tuesday morning. So anyway, heat heat and negativity are, are close cousins. Those they go together. On e even in the Bible, people have uh, taken the train to negative town. Uh, there's so many examples, but you, you get Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes. He he has everything in the world, and what does he declare? It's all meaningless. It's meaningless, meaningless. All this, all these things I've done, and, and all all the world, everything the world has to offer, meaningless. And then we've got Elijah who sulks in a cave, and God comes and visits him and says, "What's wrong, Elijah?" And and he says, "Nobody knows." <laughs> yeah. He just he's just like, "Look, I'm God. I'm all by myself." Nobody else is doing any good for, you know, I'm the only one. Nobody knows. And, of course, Job is the absolute classic of, of negative, yeah, if we want to go there. Uh, it doesn't end and really is, a, is, a, is I, I read it every year and reading through the Bible, and I find that it's more interesting every year. But he does, he does have the, the classic line of, may, may the, the day I was born be erased be swept away, be disappear. And so we have basically in the Bible like uh, we have in the Bible, and uh, thanks be to God that we do, we have uh, humanity being real, expressing the experience of fighting depression, which is real in this life. And Jesus had every reason in the world to be depressed in the night of the upper room. He was going to die the next day. He was going to be tortured, arrested, tortured, and hung on a cross to die. He was leaving his ministry, his mission that he had worked so hard for, that he had come to earth for, in the hands of 12, no, 11 ragamuffins, chicken you-know-whats, these guys. And then they didn't have AC back then, so he might have been a little warm himself. So he had, he had all the reasons to be depressed, Jesus, at that moment. But what you see in that upper room that night, you see a confident Jesus. You see a courageous Jesus. And so may, may his confidence and his faith and his courage lift us up this morning like cold Freon blowing through your home. Jesus finishes the Upper Room Discourse with a prayer. That's the way he finishes, finishes it up. And, and last week we, were, we did the first half of that prayer, and Jesus prayed for the disciples. And now we're doing the second half of the prayer, and he opens it up. He expands the prayer. And this is, verse, this is verses 20 and 21. I pray not only for these, that's the disciples, but also for those who through their teaching will come to believe in me. May they all be one, just as, Father, you are in me and I am in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe it was you who sent me. Jesus' confidence is, is really amazing here. His vision, it, it goes viral. It, it's 
beyond the room. It's beyond the circumstances. It's beyond the Jerusalem, the next day, the Roman Empire. He's, he's seeing things that are going to happen deep, deep, deep into the future. He sees, he sees the 11 going out and spreading the word through the Mediterranean, the Middle East, India, North Africa. They went out and they spread it. And then, then he sees generations of the word being spread on and on and on to the ends of the earth. He sees, he sees the final frontier with Captain Kirk aboard the Starship Enterprise. I mean, he's, you know, who knows where this, we don't, we're only part of it. I mean, it goes, keeps going. He sees, he has this vision of what's going to happen, and he's praying about it. He sees it happening. He's praying. He's so confident. Think about it. He's praying for all the generations, including us, of people that will believe these, th these 11 ragamuffins' message. He's, he know, he, it's going to happen. This is going to happen. He's so confident, and he's praying for us. And the fact that here we are 2,000 years later, and we're reading his word, being filled with his spirit, being transformed into that next generation of disciples is amazing. It is, a, it is an absolutely amazing thought. It should give us all confidence. We have, there's, there's lots of reasons to be negative. Let's not miss the very clear and obvious reasons to be positive. And one of them is that here we are. 2,000 years later, we've got this word. God has ensured it. It has happened. Jesus' vision is true. This is evidence. This is amazing. Here we are. Amen. Let's not miss the good stuff here. This is, you know, a grassroots movement began with Jesus, passed on to 11 people, in over 2,000 years has overcome every single obstacle, including our own hard hearts. That's a miracle. Amen to that. Let's be positive. And every time we gather, even little old us, OCC, we testify to the world that this is true. That Jesus is God's son. That he was sent from the Father. And that our relationship with him is real and true in today and tomorrow and forever. So this is, these are reasons to be positive. And what... What Jesus wants is for the world to notice. That's what he's praying for. He wants, he wants the world to notice that this is continuing. And he wants the world to come to faith. And Paul says in, in 1 Timothy that God and our Savior want every person to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what Jesus wants. That's what he prayed for. That's what he's praying for now. So let's address this oneness Jesus is speaking of. Sometimes we, we read this and we immediately get into this kind of, we, we feel like it's this ecumenical call where all the denominations and all the different churches, and we need to, we need to be one. That's what Jesus is praying for. We need to make this happen. So, so let's, let's make a human effort to, make, to get all these people together so, so we're one and, and we testify to the world. And that's not really what this is about. Uh, it's it's not about us doing that. It's it, now that can happen, and it, it, I'm not necessarily against. I'm not against that, but it's not. It's going to happen as a byproduct of the oneness. So let's look at what the oneness is. It's going to be God's work. It's not going to be ours. So let's take a look at this oneness because this is what Jesus continues to teach about. This is what I see the theme is for today. This is. Verses 22 and 23, I have given them the glory. That's an important word today. The glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. With me in them and you in me, may they be so perfected in unity that the world will recognize that it was you who sent me and that you have loved them as you have loved me. Last week, Dad, John, gave the message, and he talked about glory. And it was probably the best description of glory I've, I've ever heard. It was, it was great. And you need to listen to it if you weren't here. And you can go to our website, and you can listen to glory. 
And, and uh, I, afterwards I saw Glory, Mary Beth was out in the lobby and there was Glory going around on top of it. And that's what he, he was saying. It's, it's God's, pre Glory is God's presence. That's from the Old Testament. Glory is God's presence. And, and when we notice, and we who have the Holy Spirit can recognize it, and we see that someone's filled with, with God's presence. It's not of the world. It's of God. It's something special. And so that's what glory is. And so some people are filled with glory, and it's a marvel to see. And so we notice it through the Holy Spirit. But the world actually also can notice it, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's, he's wanting the world to recognize the glory. And what the world recognizes is the world recognizes things like relationships. The world recognizes that, that there's a love and a care and a concern going on. That there's forgiveness and reconciliation in a long-lasting relationship, a long-lasting marriage, friendship, family that's stuck together through all these things. That's what the world notices. The world notices these relationships. And hopefully they realize, and we're telling them, look, it's, to God, it's God's glory. It is God's glory that, that we're still together. And then Dad talked about the glorious relationship last week, which is, a, um, which is my thing that I invented, my term, the glorious relationship, in an attempt to describe the Trinity, the mystery of, of what the Trinity is. And so I've, I've made up this idea of the glorious relationship. And it was nice to hear someone else talk about it because maybe that idea isn't so crazy after all. So it was nice to hear someone talk about it. But the glorious relationship is, is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in a perfect relationship with each other, reflecting and sharing glory. They're passing the basketball. They're high-fiving. They're working together. There's chemistry there in that relationship. And I remember a, a, a guy asking me about, he was struggling with this idea of, of the Trinity and, and a lot of uh, uh, new religious movements and such try to poke at the Trinity. You know the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. Uh, yeah, so it's a word that was invented to describe what's d talked about in the Bible. You could... You could say, let's, let's turn to John 17 and let's see, let's see what the, the Trinity is. Uh, you can turn lots of places. But it is a tough concept. There's, there's three, but there's one. There's only one God, but then there's three. And so it, it is this, this mystery and, and how, do, how do we describe it and how do we think about it. And so the Trinity was, was one way that the, the early church decided this is how we're going to kind of describe this, this wonderful mystery that, that God is. And I remember I gave this guy, and he's asking me, and I was in seminary at the time, and I gave this very dense, theological, very boring, and probably more hard to understand. So I, I probably put him behind a, a few steps in, in understanding what the Trinity is. And then later on in reflection is, is usually when we get our best ideas of what we should have said. Uh, I, I thought about, as my dad has said, he comes up with his best sermons on, on Monday, out in the yard when he says, oh, I should have said this. That's when the, that's when he, the best sermons are. And so I, I thought later, I was like, wait a second, I had, I had the perfect illustration for this guy. He, here he was, he's married and, and, and they have a child. So there, I, I had one just sitting right there for the taking. What's the Trinity like? It's like your family. Don't you see? You're, in a, you're three different people, but you're one, aren't you? Don't you sense you have, there's a oneness there that you're connected? That's what the Trinity is. It's, it's that imperfection. It's that love relationship that works. That's, that's what it is. And so that's what I've, that's kind of prompted me and, and started talking about what is the Trinity? It's this glorious, glorious relationship. It's about a relationship. And what I like about the glorious relationship is that we're included. We're invited in. Jesus is actually praying for us to be part of it here. Now, if you said, if, if you said, uh, I'm part of the Trinity, you might get, <laughs> you might get burned at the stake, okay? I, that's, that's not going to work. You, you probably can't say that. I, that oh, yes, no, I am part of the Trinity. Uh, the pastor told me, and he said, you can find it in John, John 17. No, that's not going to, but 
uh, you can say I'm part of the glorious relationship. So that's what I like about it. That's why I've kind of, you know, I'm not trying to come up with necessarily anything new. I'm just trying to understand it myself and, and share. And so we're part of the glorious relationship. In fact, I think that's the reason we're created. There was the glorious relationship, the relationship that's eternal before the foundation of the world. And they said, let's let's bring some more in. Let's bring some others into our team. Let's create and bring them into this glorious relationship that we have. And that's what Jesus wants. And that's what he's praying for. And that's what can happen for us. Look what Jesus says about it here. This is in these verses that are up here. With me in them and you in me, may they be so perfected in unity that the world will recognize. See, unity doesn't come from human efforts. It's not going to come from, from our human organization, from attempts to, from ecumenical attempts and, and, and human things, political things, social media. That's not the way we're going to be brought together. It's going to be God's work. It comes from being part of the glorious relationship. What we need to do is we need to make sure we're part of the glorious relationship. Then the unity will happen. Then we'll, we'll recognize someone else that's also part of it. And the spirit will bring us together. That's the way the unity happens. The world, the world recognizes relationships. And the world recognizes the strengths that we can gain from these relationships. In these relationships, the glorious relationship is God's work. And, and it's, also our, it, it, it's also us putting our faith in it and, and, and going towards it and being part of it. And Jesus wants the world to understand two things, is, is what he says here. That it was you who sent me. So Jesus is saying, I want the world to recognize that it is Father God who sent Jesus so that means Jesus is from God, and this is really the big thing in John. This is what John the Baptist testified to. This is what, why John wrote his gospel. This is what Jesus says time and time and time again in this gospel. He's just saying, I'm from God. I'm from God. I came from the Father up above. Here I am. He sent me. That's what Jesus continually, continually says. And the good news is that's all that was required in John's gospel to be part of the glorious relationship is just to recognize and believe that Jesus is from God. That's all you have to do. That's the only thing that's required to enter the glorious relationship. Now, in John, he makes it very clear and Jesus makes it clear to believe that means a lot. To believe that Jesus is from God, that he's part of the glorious relationship, that God has come down and become flesh and dwelt among us, the one and only God. To believe that that's true means we have to live like that's true. We've got to really listen to this guy. We've got to worship this guy. We've got to submit and obey to this guy because he is God. He's sent by God. He's God's messenger. He's part of the glorious relationship and so that we want to be part of, that God wants us to be part of, and he's our bridge into it. So we've got to trust him. We've got to live that way. His word is our life. It's our light. It's our bread. It's our water. Are we living like that? That's all that's required to believe that, but then also to live like that. That's what, that's what we need to do. And that's when we live like that, we find that we are part of the glorious relationship. We feel it. We sense it. We're part of it. Are we living with that kind of faith? And then the, the second thing that Jesus wants the world to understand is that you have loved them as you have loved me. You, God, have loved them believers, not only the disciples, but everyone who believes the disciples' message, as you have loved me, Jesus. So actually, if I'm reading this correctly, and I've looked at it quite a few times, it says, 
that God loves us the exact amount that he loves Jesus. Do you believe that? Is, is that we, that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus? Doesn't that sound like a crazy idea? I don't, I don't know if I can mentally accept that. It just seems like that can't possibly be true, but that's what he's saying, that God loves us that much. And that's what the glorious relationship is. It's equal. It's even. The love and the glory is being shared and reflected back and forth. To be part of it is to be loved the same as Jesus. There's no hierarchy within it. So we're loved as believers. We're loved as much as Jesus loved his only son. Are you accepting that kind of love from Jesus? So we need to believe that Jesus is is from the Father and live that way, and then we need to accept the love that he has for us. Are you accepting God's love for you? As much as he loved Jesus. And... It's being part of this glorious relationship where Jesus gets all his confidence here in the upper room where he should be terrified, negative, angry, fearful, all the depressed, should be in a black place, yet he has all this confidence. Where does his confidence come from? It comes from being part of the glorious relationship. He says, it doesn't matter. They could do whatever they want physically to my body because I am part of the glorious relationship and nobody can touch that. Nobody can take that away. The love relationship is eternal. So he gets his confidence from that relationship. He has peace that no one can take him out of that relationship. And then he gets his confidence from the work that will be produced from him submitting to God that's going to happen. And this is where he gets, he finds joy. So he has peace and joy. This is, you know, you guys have heard this is my, my favorite verse right now is, is the he- Hebrews 12 two, For the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. For the joy for the joy of what that work would produce. That's why he did it. And so he was, not only he had peace, that even though his his torture and crucifixion would not wreck his relationship, he had the joy of knowing that what what he was about to do would produce then the bridge for us to join him. That's the joy. The joy he had was bringing us into the glorious relationship. That's what he was so joyful about. So here in this place where he should have been totally dark and depressed, he has peace and he has joy. And we can have the same thing because we're also part of the glorious relationship. And no one could ever take it that take us out of it. And if we're doing God's work, we can be joyful because God's going to do good things through it. God's going to bring others into the glorious relationship through it. God will use it. And so we see Jesus' confidence, his amazing confidence, on the night before he's, he's, he's going to be killed, on that night where he should have been in a dark place, we see his great confidence in these last two verses. This is 25 and 26. Father, upright one, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. I have made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and so that I may be in them. At first, Jesus seems to come back down to reality to kind of fall into this this dark place when he says that the world has not known you. And so he's, he's saying, you know, Nobody gets it, which he, he really could. Here, here he's done all this work and he's giving his life for it and there's only 11 guys left. He could be very depressed about that. And so he's saying, the, world, the world's not recognizing you. The world doesn't know you. But, and here's what we can learn from Jesus here, is what he focus on, focuses on, how he fights that darkness and depression. He does it right here. 
He does it through prayer. He's in prayer. And then he focuses on these positive things. He doesn't focus on the negative. The world, he, he knows the reality that the world's probably not going to get it. Most people are not going to get this. You know, there's the narrow gate and there's the wide gate. Jesus was clear. Most people aren't going to get this. That's not, that's not your concern. Don't worry about that. What he does is he focuses on the positives as he's in prayer. That's how he battles the negativity and depression, and we can do the same thing. Watch how he does this. He, gives us, he basically gives us an how, a how-to battle it. Right here, he says, Father, upright one, focus on the Lord and his goodness, that he is good, he is upright, he is righteous. Focus on the Lord. These have known you sent me. He's saying, I know the world doesn't get it, but I'm sitting here with 11 who do. And I'm focusing on them. And I'm rejoicing in them. And I'm happy with my relationship with them. I've brought 11 into the glorious relationship, and I'm happy about that, and I have joy. Focus on the ones that do have faith. Focus on the saints. And then he says, I have made you known to them. He's focusing on his call, what he was supposed to do. I have, Father, here I am, here I am, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done tomorrow, but I've made you known. I've done my work. I've made you known to them. He's focusing on his call. If we're dark and depressed, we need to get out of ourselves. We need to focus on the Lord, and we need to focus on our call. And then he says, and I will continue. He's not going to give up. Never give up. And then he says, so that the love with which you love me may be in them. And so he focuses on love. He focuses on the love that is in the glorious relationship and that it, they, they will be in it as well. And then he says, and so I may be in them. And so he's, here it is. He's saying, in, in all this comes the glorious relationship. All this comes the relationship that is everlasting and eternal. And that's probably the most depressing thing is that relationships don't last. That people die. That loved ones we have, you know, sometimes there are seasons of life where they're taken away from us. And they're, they're living somewhere else and our relationship just isn't there. And we, we think about how, how great of a time we had with them. Or someone that we love dies. And so they're taken away from us f f for life. And so that's, that's the most depressing thing, is that we lose the relationship. And, this, and what we see here is that's not the fact with the glorious relationship. It cannot be taken away. It's eternal, it's before time, and it's everlasting. And so that's, our, that's how we combat negativity. That's how we find confidence in difficult circumstances like Jesus. This is how we do it. He's showing us how to do it. He's showing us in this prayer. And it's all about the glorious relationship. That's our antidote for darkness and depression. So let's spend just a couple minutes and allow, allow the Lord to lift you up. Allow Jesus to come in. Whatever darkness you have, allow that light to come into it. Spend a couple minutes in prayer.